हाँ देखो आ गया होगा फेसबुक आ गया जी साहब क्या हाल है आपके जी जी थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर साहब आई वाज स्लाइटली कंफ्यूज अच्छा किया आपने ठीक है लोग आ रहे हैं जी डॉक्टर साहब मेरे ख्याल में पांच एक मिनट हम दे देते हैं फोर्टी वन की रजिस्ट्रेशन है हमारे पास तो अभी जो हमारे पास है ट्वेल्व है फाइव मिनट और लोग भी आ जाएंगे तो फिर हम फॉर्मली इन द मीन टाइम की मैं बता दू इस दफा हमने एडवर्टीजमेंट पे लिख दिया था कि वेब कैम मैंडेटरी है पीसी की तो ये अब अनाउंसमेंट नहीं की जाएंगी लास्ट टाइम आपको पता है माहौल कुछ खराब हो गया था लोगों ने लोग अपनी सीट से उठ जाते हैं और बस वो कैमरा पे अपनी तस्वीर लगा लेते हैं तो दिस इज नॉट एक्सेप्टेबल जी और ये अच्छा नहीं लगता मुझे बार बार ये कहते हुए और जिस वक्त ये लेक्चर शुरू हो जाएगा और फिर मैं बार बार अगर इंटरव्यून करूंगा तो स्पीकर का फ्लो टूट जाता है तो काइंडली अभी मैं उर्दू में अनाउंसमेंट कर रहा हूँ कि प्लीज अपने वेब कैम्प ऑन कर लें अपना क्योंकि ये एक्सक्यूज मानी नहीं जाएगी कि आपका जी आपका नेट ठीक नहीं है ये एक मैंडेटरी चीज है जो पीस ने रिक्वायरमेंट लगाई है आपने लेक्चर सुनेंगे तो आपको सीडी सर्टिफिकेट मिलेगा तो इसके बगैर नहीं मिलेगा सिर्फ लेडीज के लिए एक एक्सेप्शन है वो अपना फेस कवर करना चाहें तो जरूर करें उसमें कोई ममानत नहीं है लेकिन अपियर लाइव होना है वेब कैम पे तो काइंडली इसको कर ले ताकि मुझे बार बार अनाउंसमेंट ना करनी पड़े And then the process will be there. So if you go to get, who experience for later, I will pass. Of course, who we are? Who? I'm not sure. He may have been doing that. He is not saying. I think that's the same. Okay, okay. But why not? हमारा जो थर्ड पार्टी स्टेशन है पता चल गया आपको कौन अच्छा कुछ दिक्कत नहीं थी मैंने कर दी क्या
मेरे हाल में जो रिमोट स्टेशन है ना उनको कहें कि वो फेसबुक पे मॉनिटर करें और जो इधर आप है ना आप इसको करें उस पर अपना कर रही हूँ बस ठीक बस ठीक है ठीक है आपके पास एग्जैक्ट रजिस्ट्रेशन कितनी है फोर्टी वन की है तो ये तो सिक्सटीन अभी हुए हमारे पास हमारे पास इस वक्त फोर्टी वन के जी रजिस्ट्रेशन है तो एट द मोमेंट वी हैव सेवनटीन पार्टिसिपेंट तो मैं थोड़ा इंतजार कर रहा हूँ कि कम से कम फिफ्टी परसेंट से हम ऊपर चले जाए क्योंकि तो फिर बार बार लोग आते हैं और डिस्टर्बेंस होती है मैं असल में किसी को रिफ्यूज नहीं कर सकता एंट्री तो ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव हो जाए तो वी विल स्टार्ट भी इन शाह डॉक्टर फवाद आप मुझे कैन यू हियर मी फवाद साहब जी जी सर आई कैन हियर यू सर इफ यू वांट टू वी हैव टू थ्री मिनट्स इफ यू वांट टू टेस्ट द शेयर स्क्रीन यू कैन डू इट नाउ अगर आप अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन करना चाहें तो प्लीज कर दें जरा शोर शोर पहले बहुत ही प्रेजेंटेशन कर दें सर एनेबल करें शेयरिंग ऑफ स्क्रीन फ्रॉम माय एंड अच्छा जी मैं भी जी कर दिया सर आप करें नाइस जी परफेक्ट वी कैन नाउ व्यू योर शेयर स्क्रीन जी माशा अर्थ को एक इंजीनियरिंग फंडामेंटल थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर हैविंग मी चले जी अब इसको मेरे ख्याल में आप बंद कर दें शेयर स्क्रीन हम हम फॉर्मली जी शुरू करते हैं और सर सर जी थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब आप थोड़ी देर के लिए मेरे पास आ जाएंगी यहाँ जितने लोग आई जाएं उनको करें मैं फॉर्मली शुरू करता हूँ दो बज के आठ मिनट हो गए आप जरा इधर जितने लोग अब आई जाए ना तो उनको एंटर कर ही जाना मैं थोड़ी देर में मैं अनाउंसमेंट कर देता हूँ ये बेशक आप इधर रखने अपने बाद इसको माउस को और इसको पीछे बैठ जाए आप जब तक मैं वापस कंट्रोल पे आता हूँ तो फिर आप चली जाना अपनी जगह पे थैंक यू बिस्मिल्लाम आई वेलकम ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट हियर ऑन द ट्वेंटी सेवेंथ ऑनलाइन टेक्निकल लेक्चर एज यू नो टूडे स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर फवाद मुजफ्फर बिफोर आई इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर साहब टू यू लेट मी रिपीट द रूल्स अगेन सो दैट देर इज नो कंफ्यूजन रिगार्डिंग द रूल्स फर्स्ट द फोर मोस्ट इज you you must appear live on the webcam that is mandatory by pec and there is no relaxation against this rule except one exception is for the ladies if they want to cover their face no issues they can 
but they have to appear live. Two, during your lecture, microphone has to be in mute position so that no background noise disturbs the speaker. Third, Dr. Saab, I need your advice on it regarding the question answer session. What do you prefer? Should it be during the lecture or at the end as a routine as we have at the end 20 minutes question answer session? So please advise me, what would you prefer? Um, so if there's something that is, you know, so if someone feels that is really essential, then they can, but I would really appreciate if everyone can wait till the end because, you know, uh, there's That's a flow. Of Thank you. It's as per your convenience. So ladies and gentlemen, as you have already heard the speaker, that he is more convenient if you ask the question during the question answer session. And during, the, and during the lecture, you can keep on text, uh, sending me the text uh, or your questions that will be noted. And uh, I will ask those questions uh, to Dr. Saab during the question answer uh, session, which will be after the lecture. So that will be, uh, we give around 20 minutes for the question answer session. Uh, so as far as rules were concerned, this is the rule now. Again, the topic today is uh, time history analysis of buildings. Speaker, very uh, uh, reputable speaker, highly reputable, Dr. Fouad Muzaffar. I will just introduce him and then inshallah, the lecture will be start, uh, starting. Uh, Dr. Saab did his bachelor's with honors in civil and environmental engineering from UET Lahore in the year 2000. Afterwards, he worked on a number of site projects as a site engineer for a couple of years, including the Gadi Shahu Bridge, Lahore. He joined the Lahore Office of National Engineering Services of Pakistan, which is NESPAC, in the year 2001. During his lecture with, uh, sorry, during his tenure with the NESPAC, he worked on the design of transportation structures and was involved in design of pre-stressed br bridges and culverts on N70 from Kajuri to Bivata. Islamabad, Murray dual carriage highway, then access bridge of Naval Colony, Anchorage, Islamabad, slab bridge on Hudaira, Udhana Road, Sialkot, and number of other projects. In the year 2004, he proceeded to Stanford University, California on a merit scholarship and university fellowship to pursue higher studies in structures. He completed his master's and PhD in structural engineering from Stanford University uh, with a CGPA of 3.93. The title of his research thesis was a rational approach towards modeling of post P shear deformation behavior of concrete frame elements within the fi finite element context. Currently, he is serving as a general manager, engineering and planning infrastructure in infrastructure uh, development authority of Punjab, which is commonly known as IDAP. In his capacity, he is heading the engineering design section of IDAP. He has extensive experience in design and vetting of multiple projects, including High Q Tower, uh, City Shopping Mall, Sky Park One then Pakistan Kidney and Liver Institute and, uh, and Tayyab Artogon Hospital, Punjab Food and Drug Authority, Information Technology University and Orient Towers. Besides that, since I got his uh, introduction in a hurry from uh, Mrs. Sadia, so I really don't know uh, regarding his publications and research papers, my, he must have uh, being presented papers also. So I leave it to Dr. Saab if he wants to uh, uh, tell the participants regarding his uh, research work. So this was the brief introduction of Dr. Saab. And let me tell you, this is his third lecture on, our pla on the platform of PSC. Before that, he has uh, his lecture, first lecture was on design of building, the state of practice in Pakistan versus the state of art. And his second lecture, lecture was on design of buildings. So I'm pretty sure today's lecture would be very informative for all of you. 
and you will enjoy the lecture. And again, please keep your webcams open. This is a policy, mandatory policy of PEEC. And don't force me to make the announcements again and again. This will disturb the speaker's flow. Thank you very much. Dr. Sir, the floor is yours. Please start your lecture. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Ahmed Tarsa, for the introduction. Um, so let me uh, take you straight away to, uh, I'll be to the point, I understand that most of you guys are here for the PEC credits that you get. Um, so I'll be, I'll try to make it as interesting as, as possible and, uh, and to the point. So um, let me start off with uh, some of the preliminaries. Why do we need response spectrum analysis? Well, um, there are two things. When you carry out response spectrum an analysis, uh, you lose correlation between the different uh, the force uh, effects in different component, uh, in, in different directions. For example, um, the if, uh, for example, the minor axis. Uh, if you consider a column that is at the edge of the building. Um, you know, if you carry out response spectrum analysis, you what you uh, ETABs will typically give you is an envelope of axial forces, um, major bending moment and minor bending moment. But you do not know as to which of the three uh, concurrently exist at any particular time. So uh, the same is the case with the shear wall design and ETABs, whereas it uses the um, you know the envelope. Uh, uh, of all of the forces, along with the uh, different combinations, uh, all possible combinations of these forces. Your Doctor, your uh, screen is not shared. I'm just reminding you. Okay, thank you, thank you. You uh, basically um, lose, uh, your, your shear wall design uh, is basically either very overestimated in case they, uh, there is a, you know, axial tension uh, in your shear wall, or it can be very conservative. So, uh, and the third reason for uh, time history analysis is if you are analyzing a building which is not a typically, um, you know, which does, which does not fall into the category of a typical building covered by the ACI code, then you cannot have a value of R and omega and all those uh, CD factors that are conveniently listed in uh, ASCE or UBC uh, code. So you have to then uh, basically go into time history analysis and, uh, uh, you know, first uh, uh, use uh, the design level earthquake and then the MCR level earthquake to check the stability and serviceability of the building. So, um, you know, uh, with this introduction of the needs, let me share um, uh, some of the things that are the preliminaries before you start to before you start to uh, do time history analysis. Um, so um, I'll take I'll I'll take you to the slide number probably seventeen and uh, I, or sixteen. I you know earthquakes are recorded by accelerometers, and those accelerometers are buried in the ground. But I just wanted to make a point here that. You cannot take out raw data from accelerometers and use it for uh, structural analysis purposes because it contains a lot of noise. Now, by noise, what I mean is, uh, you know, these accelerometers are really sensitive, and therefore, uh, you know, all the low frequency noise that human activity is generating and the high frequency, along with the high frequency uh, vibrations of me mechanical equipment, um, they are also recorded. Uh, in by the accelerometer. So you need to actually filter them out and apply a number of corrections before uh, you can use those recorded accelerations for your structural analysis purposes. Um, and uh, the, the way you do it is typically you uh, subject the signal to high pass filter, low pass filter, or, um, or through a band pass filter to you know, isolate all of the vibrations that are there in the ground due to earthquake only. 
So the first question that everyone uh, might be thinking of is how to select a ground motion, you know, how to select a candidate ground motion um, for analysis of your buildings. And um, this is done by considering ground motion parameters. You know, parameters is basically ground motion properties. Um, and there are three fundamental types of ground motion parameters uh, that are to be considered. The first is the amplitude parameter. The second is the frequency type of parameters. And the third is the duration type of parameters. Now, what do we mean by the three categories of um, these parameters? You must, all of you must have heard about PGA, which is a peak ground acceleration. This is basically, you take an acceleration, uh, ground history, and you take the peak value of that acceleration and you call, you, you attribute that value to that um, ground motion. Similarly, um, many of you might not have heard about PGV, which is basically you integrate the acceleration, you convert it into velocity, uh, time history function, uh, and then you like, uh, you identify the peak value of the velocity um, and, and associate it with the ground motion. And lastly, you know, you can integrate the velocity time history into displacement time history and pick up the peak value of the displacement of that function to, uh, to get what is known as PGD. So um, I have explained this a uh, little bit in the coming slides. If you, uh, you know, the amplitude parameter, the peak ground acceleration is, this is an acceleration time history in front of you in figure five. And what basically you do is you take the absolute maximum or absolute of the maximum or the minimum and you call it the PGA. Now, most of the people, uh, they think that this is the only parameter that will that is of value. I can tell you that there are um, examples of ground motion histories where your PGA was really high, but the duration was so less that those ground motion uh, did not even you know, affect the oscillation of the structures. Um, so those uh, PGA is important, but it's not the total story behind um, the uh, behind the effects of due to earthquake. Similarly, this is uh, less jagged than the last plot. And you can see that, you know, you can go there and you can pick this value to be the PGB, which is approximately greater than 20 uh, centimeters per second. Uh, and lastly, you know, you can look at the signal and you can pick this value up there. If you can see my cursor, can you, I hope you guys can see my cursor. Um, and let me change it to, well, I think you guys can see the cursor. Um, so this is the value that you will put, uh, pick in this case and you call it PGD. Okay, and this slide actually shows the relationship between, uh, between the three. You know, PGV is integration of PGA and PGD is integration of, uh, as a result, oh, sorry, not PGD. The acceleration ground uh, history is at the top, then followed by uh, velocity time history and the displacement time history, right? So uh, each of the plot, the velocity time history plot is an integration of the acceleration time history and the displacement time history is an integration of the velocity time history. So this was that. The next important thing to consider when you are selecting a ground motion is and it's really important is the frequency content uh, parameters. Now, if you are a geologist or a geoscientist, you are not interested in response spectrum, but you are interested in Fourier spectrum. Fourier spectrum is basically a plot of the coefficient of Fourier series of a particular ground motion history. So you will get a plot that looks typically, uh, you know, uh, like the ones that are shown on this slide. And if you look at the plots, you can see that, you know, this is a pretty jagged plot. And what I can tell you from this plot is that which, which uh, frequency of which signal is dominant. Um, so for example, in the plot uh, shown at the top, 
uh, you can see that uh, the frequency content of the ground motion is uh, very high. This is typical in a rock, uh, uh, rocky terrain, but uh, from the same geographic area, but a different uh, site, which is located on, sorry, which is located on softer soil, you can see that the frequency content is, uh, of, of the dominant frequency content of the signal is, um, has a much larger frequency as compared to the first uh, plot. So, you know, basically the Fourier spectrum of a acceleration ground history would tell you as to uh, the, the, the nature of the acceleration history that is, um, you know, affecting your building. Now, as engineers, we are not that interested in Fourier spectrum because we are more interested in forces in the building. And so therefore, we, what we do is we uh, plot or we deal with the response spectrum. And response spectrum is basically, uh, in case you guys you know, are not introduced to it properly, is basically you take a single degree of freedom system, you uh, simulate, the dynamic response of that system due to a ground motion uh, history. And then you basically take out the maximum value of a ground uh, of any dynamic parameter. Now that parameter can be spectral acceleration, it can be mm, the spectral velocity or any other parameter. Typically in response spectrum, we take out, uh, we take out the spectral acceleration and we plot it, you know, um, as a function of time of the oscillator. Uh -huh. And basically what this tells us is, you know, uh, a relationship between the natural time period of the oscillator and the dynamic parameter of interest. Usually that dynamic parameter of interest is the spectral acceleration because we are interested in the force, forces in the structure. So uh, this is how a response spectrum looks like uh, after it has been plotted. The last parameter is also very important. It's called the duration parameter. And basically what it, you, are, you are looking at a particular signal and you, are, you, want, uh, you don't want the signal to be too short in duration because it won't start to affect your building or the structure before it ends. So uh, PGA along with, you know, I have another slide. So if you, PGA is mostly, you know, considered as the dominant parameter of interest for most of the practitioners. But if you look at the time histories on the left side and on the right side, whereas the PGA, of the time history uh, shown on the left side is much higher. The duration is much shorter. Whereas on the right side, you know, the PGA might be lower than the uh, acceleration time history on the left side, but the duration is much longer. And so as a structural engineer, you, you would not like to have a ground motion that looks like A, to, um, uh, uh, you not like to use this function to simulate force effects because it will not impart energy, sufficient energy to your, um, to your system. So, uh, you know, to measure these things, there, is, uh, there are uh, duration parameters and one of the most common duration parameters is the bracketed duration. Basically, what bracketed duration is, you fix the threshold of a certain acceleration uh, value in absolute terms, uh, and then you track your, your ground motion. Once, the, uh, once this acceleration is exceeded for the first time, you start counting the duration, and until you know the last time it exceeds that same value or the same threshold. And the time difference between the two is known as a bracketed duration. So, um, you know, uh, lastly, you know, uh, you would like to measure the energy that 
you are imparting your structure to and for that purpose you know you have uh, other parameters and these parameters are um, basically areas intensity areas intensity is nothing but what you do is you integrate the area under your acceleration response spectrum as a function of time and you plot it like this one you know this is actually you are integrating the square of the area under your acceleration response spectrum and the idea is that you know the negative areas do not cancel out the positive areas and you plot it so what this curve is telling you is how much energy as a function of time is imparted to your structure okay so i just wanted to give you a very brief introduction of you know the ground motion parameters uh, for those of you who might be getting confused as to what parameters mean the ground motion properties what properties would you consider when you are selecting a ground motion to carry out time steel analysis of your structure so we went through again we went through the amplitude parameters the peak ground acceleration peak ground velocity or peak ground displacement we went through the frequency parameters which is the fourier spectrum or the response spectrum fourier spectrum is of interest to the geotechnical engineers whereas the response spectrum is of interest to the engineers because we want the response of the structure not a input not we are not that much interested in the uh, uh, we are not primarily interested in the properties of the input uh, acceleration signal and the last is the bracketed duration so with this idea of you know the the ground motion parameters what you do is the next problem that you will face is okay fine from where can i download my ground motion histories and for this purpose there are um, you know uh, there are a number of websites around the world in my design office what we typically use is um you know we use the ngo west uh, website to download the ground motion histories and the reason is you need to trust the source of the ground motion you need to try, you need to be sure that the source has carried out all of the you know uh, the, the 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 filtering and all of the pre processing of the ground motion properly so for that purpose you know uh, let me show you how, how to do it um you said you know okay um so can you guys see the i think yeah i think you guys can see the peer website right so the website address is ngwest2.berkeley.edu this website is basically uh, you know hosted by berkeley university and you go there and you basically the first time you go there you'll have to sign up okay there is a fair use policy so if you download too much of stuff it will block you for a while because it's not for commercial use so we have to be judicious about it we have to be we have to be appreciative of the fact that someone is hosting it for the world for free so just download all only those ground motion histories which you need so in this case my colleague um, walid mirza uh, is basically a university of illinois graduate um, he has uh, already made a uh, he has signed up for for the peer website one thing that i would like to caution you guys about is um, right now they are working on subduction zone ground motion histories so when we are using these ground motion histories from nga2 website these are from earthquakes that are shallow crustal earthquakes these earthquakes are um, the magnitude of these earthquakes is much lesser the magnitude and duration of these earthquakes is much lesser as compared to subduction zone earthquakes in pakistan uh, we are mostly affected by uh, in the northern areas we are mostly affected by the main boundary thrust fault mbt 
and MMT faults, and those faults are basically subduction zone faults. So we use this these time histories with this caution that we are uh, you know making the best uh, use of the available resources, but we should know that there are the subduction zone earthquakes are a completely a different animal. So one, once you have signed up for this website, uh, what you need to do is you need to click on the NGA West database, okay? And you will, you will actually get a, a host of these values in front of you. Now this website is primarily developed for the US audience. So you will see ASE code spectrum, which is not the case, you know, in Pakistan. We, what we do is we click on the user defined spectrum. Okay. And once you have done it, you need to create an Excel file that contains the response spectrum uh, for which you are downloading the ground motion histories. Now let me show you the, the, uh, the format of the Excel file. The Excel file should be in the CSV format. Okay. So let me share that with you guys. Yeah. So what you need to do is the first column Okay, okay, just got it. So the second column is actually the spectral acceleration, all right? And um, so from zero seconds to 12 seconds, basically zero seconds is PGA. Zero seconds is means an, uh, an oscillator of infinite strength, which is not possible. So 0 0.01, use 0 0.02 seconds or something like that. But in this case, we have zero seconds, okay? So, Valid here has created this CSV. You know, if you can look at the top, this is for Multan, and it's a CSV file format. Again, first column, time period, second column, spectral acceleration. You create this file, you save it on your hard drive at a known location, and then you go to the NGA website, NGA peer website. You upload that file by clicking by clicking there and choosing the file. Right? So TS Multan CSV open, right? And then you upload it. The reason why we are uploading the response spectrum file is because we want to download the ground motion histories which approximately match the shape of the sorry the response spectrum due to which approximately matches the shape of our target response spectrum. again we want to download time histories the response spectrum of which approximately matches the shape of your response uh, of your target response spectrum. okay so once we have done that, we I, I'll click on submit. It will show this screen in front of me. And initially it will show you the, uh, your response spectrum in the log log scale. But if I change it, it, it will show you the target response spectrum um, in the uh, in, in the in, in this format in the linear scale, okay? So after I've done this, after I've uploaded the target response spectrum, I'll click the search records, okay? Now a field, a form will appear in front of you. What you do is you basically, uh, you know, if you know the response from previous searches, if you know the record number, the RSN is the response spectrum uh, uh, sorry, RSN, RSN is the number of the time history which you will uh, download. So you can search that time history by, you know, just clicking here and putting the number of the 
the serial number of the time history, which you have, you know, from previous records or experience, you know that it will work and you'll come, want to come here, you want to click here and you want to retrieve that ground, particular ground motion. You can also put in the name and the station number. So actually this database contains uh, records from multiple stations for the same event. And I know that this will be confusing, so just don't bother about it. Basically, for the first time user, you can leave all of this blank. Don't worry about it, okay? Now, these are the different types of faults. Faults are, you know, anomalies or in the Earth's, on the, in the Earth crest. And in, for Pakistan, you know, I would probably go to um, reverse oblique. Reverse is basically the closest fault type to, uh, you know, the subduction zone fault. Not, ex not nearly the same, but this is the closest uh, type of fault source that I can think of, you know. And um, so I, I, I'm not going into the detail as to what the other other fault types um, you should consider. Now, if you're designing something in the northern areas, you would like your uh, magnitude of the earthquake to be around eight. Uh, in Lahore, I would probably go from four to seven, right, comma. Um, and then I would like to explain these two parameters, RJB, RRUP, um, you know, these are, parameters that are distance of that, that basically quantify the di your distance of your project site from your uh, fault zone. So if I can take you guys, uh, oops, one minute. Screen share and if I can share this with you guys, you know, this is um, just to explain what is R up and what is R uh, JB. If you have a fault, and I, I hope you guys can see this, let me zoom it in. If you have a fault and that fault is configured something like either, you know, you know, for the normal faults, they are nearly vertical, for the other faults, they are, they can be sloping, right? And RJB is basically the distance of your project site from the source along the surface, okay? In easy terms, it is the closest distance of your project site from either, from any point on the fault. If it's vertical, RJB is, you know, from this dotted dash line to this project site. If, um, you know, your uh, project site is located on the, uh, on the um, heel of the, of the fault, uh, then RJB is basically the distance from the end of the fault to your project site. So it's basically along the surface and it's the uh, smallest distance. And RRAP is basically, you know, uh, the distance not along the uh, surface, but from the fault, actual fault. All, not, not all faults would appear on the ground. You know, there are all types, uh, many faults are buried. And so, this distance RJB and RRAP is as shown in this Excel file. So um, let me take you back to my form that I was filling up. So for Lahore, for example, uh, you know, sometimes you, we would do something like, um, RJB is equal to, I would put something like 10 to 300. And the reason is if I put something more stringent, uh, it will 
gave me lesser number of uh, time histories. Uh, for Lahore, I would I should put something like six to seven hundred, right? If I am simulating um, due to uh, an earthquake that originates in my main boundary thrust, and I know Fawad Najam is listening to me, so you know I is better expert than me in seismology. And our RAP is basically, you know, I'll, you know, some put something like 10 to 300 again. And the reason is this spreadsheet was built for California, not Pakistan, and they have a lot of earthquakes that are recorded from 10 kilometers to uh, 200 kilometers. And I don't want to miss out uh, the characteristics of those earthquakes, but ideally you should be using these values uh, as per your actual site conditions, right? BS30. Now, BS30 is basically uh, your, um, it, it specifies your, your geotechnical conditions at the site. And if you go to ASC 716, uh, it gives you typical back, back, uh, duration, uh, typical values of BS30 for class A, B, C, um, and D sites. And, um, you know, the, I would uh, go to the, uh, go through to the geotechnical report and I will pick up these VS30 values and, and then I'll bracket it between the two particular values. But for the sake of this exercise, I'll put something between, let's say, it's, it's something between 300 meters per second to, let's say, 500 meters per second. Okay. Or you can actually pick these values in a better educated way by looking at ASC 716 and getting these values for class D, A, B, C, or whatever your site condition is. Okay. D595, this is. D595. Remember, I was talking about the duration of the time history. Okay. So, I think that I will put this in earthquake that has a minimum of okay. Can okay, I'm back. So, I would put something. Um, that uh, I will be interested in an earthquake that lasts for around five seconds. And, and an earthquake that lasts around for a minute, which will which will be very rare. Now, Dr. the next- Can I interrupt you for a minute, please? This is we, Again, I am making an announcement that uh, today is a very critical day. Any camps I will see now that they are not on, I will simply remove the person. This is a very serious uh, issue at this time. I had requested earlier also, please keep on checking your cams. And second, somebody, I don't want to name him, his, his uh, microphone was not in a mute position and all the voices from the background were being uh, heard by everyone. And the speaker is getting disturbed. Please cooperate with Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers Management and follow the rules. Thank you. Continue, Dr. Saab. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, you know, duration pulse light. So if you're really near the earthquake zone, which is not the case for Lahore, but it can be the case in Murray or in Northern areas. If you're really near the earthquake zone, you would like to include motions that contain a pulse in them. And I don't want to explain too much because I don't want to uh, actually confuse you guys, but these are basically, you know, when earth shakes up, and near the fault zone, it will never return to its initial position if your site is located too close to the fault zone. So uh, for all the regions that are away from uh, the pulse-like uh, regions, uh, we actually say no pulse-like records because we don't want to uh, um, you know, simulate this effect uh, for our building. Lastly, you know, maximum number of records, I'll say the maximum number of records I'll, I can want to process is 20. And um, initial scale factor, oh, this is really important. So this 
what this website does is it has a lot of time histories in it and you don't want to really take a very small mo motion ground motion and scale it by 100 to simulate your earthquake because you are actually you know it changes the nature of your acceleration ground history why does it scale it it scales it because it wants you, you have given it a target response spectrum. It will generate response spectrum from uh, uh, from the uh, from the from the time history that it, it it already has in its system, and it will then scale it up or scale it down to match as much as possible to match your target response spectrum. So that's why it, it will scale it uh, all of the, all of the time history uh, functions, but it will actually you don't want to go beyond 0.25 and 4 because it will then change the nature of the ground motion. By 0.25 is what I'm saying is you take the initial ground uh, motion history and you, uh, you uh, at, at the extreme, you can divide it by 4 in a bit to match your response, target response. Okay. Now, the other thing is you want to have... Um, now, uh, previously in U UBC 97, you used to have something called GeoMean. What this actually is, you have two components of the ground motion history, and you want the target response spectrum plotted in one direction. So you have one response spectrum, but you have two uh, ground motion histories in two directions, right? There are different ways to then combine those two uh, ground motions in, in the two different directions. Previously, GeoMean was the case. Nowadays, in AC 716, ROD D100 is used. So you will select that <clears throat> uh, for uh, if you are designing the building as per the latest um, codes. And um, you actually are telling when you click here and minimize a mean square error, minimize MSE is mean, minimize mean square error. When you are uh, enabling this feature, you will tell it as to, uh, you know, um, what, what I, what this form tell is telling the website is that it has to put equal weights at each of these durations to scale the ground motion. So once you have through, uh, once you fit all of the fields, you press search records, okay? And it will list, again, uh, I don't want a log log scale, so I'll go for the linear scale. It will replot everything. And what you see here is, are a number of those ground motion histories, you know, <clears throat> 20, in, 20 of them because I had put, I, uh, I just wanted to download or consider 20, right? So uh, if I now want to, um, for example, what, what does this show? This is actually ROD D100, which is a combination of the two orthogonal horizontal components of the ground motion history. Uh, and this is the scale factor. You know, this is what you should look at. So <clears throat> what I have, um, you know, my comfort is if I use this ground motion history is this, if I use this, I'll not be changing the original ground motion history by a lot. I'll changing, I'm changing it by a bit, but not by a lot. So if I click on it and I click view, I can actually see how it matches with my target response spectrum. Let me take out, you know, this scale target. Let me take out these guys over here. And you have your target response spectrum in red. Okay, and this, and um, and the rod D one hundred that I was looking at is in in the pink, and you can see that it is matching already. It is matching without any response spectrum matching. It is already, you know, in a very good shape. It is matching with the target response spectrum. Okay. And I can actually go there and I can pick up other um, other uh, time histories and see how it compares with my target response spectrum. Okay. 
So <clears throat> this is another plot. And let me switch it off. If you click on these buttons, you know, it will switch it off by themselves by itself. And then you see this in front of you again. So this is not that good a match because you, you see this. <clears throat> this is not exactly um, what you would like to have in, in this region. Because, why? Because your buildings are typically you know, in this region, right? You're not that concerned about a mismatch that is beyond, let's say, in Pakistan, 1.67 seconds. You don't care because your natural time period would be um, of the building, your fundamental time period would be around 1.6, 1.4 seconds. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> Once you've done it, you have the download options. If you can, I can actually let me move this. You have the download options. Um, you you check this and you say download time histories. <clears throat> what you know the peer website tells you is if you continue to download it you will be downloading an unscaled, processed, as recorded, unrotated displacement velocity acceleration phase files. What actually this is telling you is that the plot that you were, that the plot that you were looking at here, the peer website had, the peer website had scaled it, rotated it, but what you're downloading is unrotated, unscaled, and, and you cannot uh, use, uh, rely on the downloaded time history to basically, um, uh, you know, uh, argue that, uh, do, or use it as it is. You will have to rescale it. You will have to uh, rematch it, okay? <clears throat> now, this is a disappointment. Why do they do it? Because in the US, they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to stand liable for um, any calculation errors that might arise during the processes. So they show you, they can display you the match, but once you download it, they'll, you'll be downloading it um, as a raw uh, time history. So what you do is you basically <clears throat> go there and you store it at a particular location you can go there and you can double click on the zip file and you can see that you have, let me, I don't think you guys knew it. Map it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So you will get a folder that looks like this. Okay. <clears throat> now, Once you look uh, look at the folder, you will have this AT2. These are all text files, okay? AT2 is acceleration file. And 090 that you see here, I hope you guys can look at the folder. If somebody can't look at the folder, just let me know, okay? So I'm assuming you guys can. So this 090 is the angle with the azimuth. It's, you know, it's the angle with the north, the true north. And 180 is actually, again, the angle with two north. So you can see that these two, RSN68, uh, all of these files belong to one set of recorded time histories. RSN78 is a different earthquake. Okay, So RSN is the <clears throat> number, that is the, the number associated with the particular ground motion history. So the horizontal components of the ground motion history is this guy over here, which is RSN, SFERN, PEL090, and then RSN, SFERN, PEL180. This is the vertical, uh, vertical, this is the vertical component of the ground motion history, which is to be scaled uh, separately. So if you click on here, what you see is it contains all the acceleration data that you need to uh, 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 as part of your time time history. Okay, um, this is basically uh, dt is the time interval between the first and uh, between the subsequent recordings of accelerations. 
and NPTS is the number of recorded uh, acceleration, uh, the number of points that are recorded by the accelerometer during the earthquake. So as I've told you that all of these, uh, this data is now uh, in your hard drive and you can actually, you know, double click on the CSV file that is downloaded. Yes. Yes. I'm actually trying to open this and if you, there's an Excel file that downloads with it. And if you go into the Excel file, it actually gives you complete summary of all of the data that you have downloaded along with, you know, the name of the earthquake. So, you know, the, most of these earthquakes are <clears throat> from California region. So we have Hollywood, Palmdale, Fire Station, all these are basically the, the stations at which the earthquake was recorded, the RJB, RRAP, and then it also gives you the file name. So if you get somehow mixed up as to which file is which, you can actually go into the Excel file and you look at the uh, locate the file uh, the acceleration uh, containing your acceleration time history of interest. So this is actually uh, you know uh, raw data again. You need to scale it, and in this design office, in our design office, we use MATLAB to do that. <clears throat> the, uh, and once we have downloaded it, what we do is we process the data and I'll not go into the too much of detail, but once, you know, this is the code that, uh, or you'll not be able to see it, sorry. Um, let me share this, MATLAB can't be. Yeah, okay. So, you know, this is what I am uh doing right now so you go into the matlab and we have a code that have has been developed in house at idap <clears throat> just give me a second okay so uh we have a code that we have written in idap uh and what it, the code does is it takes the input signal and then it spectrally matches it with, uh, to match the target spectrum. <clears throat> this is the code running in front of you, if you can see. Okay. And once we have done it, you will be a uh, number of plots will pop up in front of you. <clears throat> Those plots are really interesting. Can you guys? Okay, I cannot even. Uh, okay, a number of plots will appear in front of you. Now, let me show you the plots. <clears throat> this is the first plot that you're looking at. What this plot is actually doing is, <clears throat> it is showing you, uh, oops, my laptop is struggling because I've opened up too many windows probably. Uh, what this is actually doing is, it is showing you uh, the target response spectrum in green, okay. The original ground motion response spectrum is in blue and the modified ground motion spectrum is in red. <clears throat> and you can see that the red is matching the green line <coughs> much more dedicatedly, right? So this is due to our in-house, uh, you know, we've written the, the code in-house. And so what does it do to Oops. So what does it do to my ground motions? And this is really important because I told you that your ground motions should not change from the original ground motion too much. Okay. And let me <clears throat> show you what it does. So this is the comparative plot again using MATLAB. Okay between my original ground motion and the ground motion that I have altered to match my target response spectrum. <clears throat> and what I, what you see here is if I really, you know, want to zoom in, 
the dot the modified line is the dotted red line and the original line is the black line <clears throat> and um you know i can take a look at through the complete duration of the time history and i can see that the peaks match pretty well um and there is not a lot of distortion maybe somewhat here at this point but this is expected <clears throat> but the peaks match well there is some distortion over here <clears throat> the peaks match pretty well otherwise so it's a good candidate it's a good match you know um and it's it's pretty much okay so the next thing that i want to see is whether you know after modification and before modification my response spectrum uh, my 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 ground will come to its original state or not remember i was talking about the pulse like motions in those cases you know <clears throat> my ground when it was started shaking but the displacement was zero it should come back to zero at the end of the uh, ground motion shaking okay so um i need to have a look at all of these things before i proceed further the code what it does is it modifies all of the in, uh, input ground motions it stores it in text format and then i have to go back to my e tabs where i have already created a model for you guys let me show you Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure. I'm struggling with screens here yeah, because I have a lot of stuff open. <clears throat> Now you can see the model, right? And I've already created a model. It's a pretty simple model of a building. Because of this. if someone cannot see the model please let me know but i am assuming that you guys can see the model okay so here you know i have defined all of the things that you would you know i'll i have uh, this is a conventional model <clears throat> that i have i have defined all the frame sections right i have defined the material uh i have i have defined um you know the mass source and everything and then in the load uh, cases of uh, functions come here ha huh. then in functions rather than going to response spectrum i'll go to my time history all right now once i've gone there what i do is i click here and i use match uh, i use custom from file Okay, and then I add new function. I browse and I find the file that I have, uh, you know, stored as a result of my my response spectrum matching. Um, and let's make it a little easier. Yeah, right. Okay, and then I open this file up. The kya tha wo? for uh, so sorry and what basically i am telling e tabs here is my data the remember the data that i was talking to you about it was stored in the text file <clears throat> and all of those num numerical values were uh, if i can show you quickly multan kidhar is me store you know Yeah. Okay. Let me show you quickly. Okay, what does four and uh, five does? Okay. Uh, yeah. Use share. Okay. So, uh, the four that you saw over there, uh, it was basically, you know, if I, if you open the text file up, the first line, the second, third, and fourth line, you know, they are, they do not contain the acceleration time history record. so what what we are telling e tabs okay so e tabs so yeah yeah 
So if what I'm telling E tabs over here is ignore the first four lines. And uh, the number of points per line, actually this is the number of rows, uh, number of points in a particular row that I'm storing. <clears throat> and uh, uh, then you have to put in uh, values at equal intervals of 0 0.02 second. Remember the time increment that I show you guys, the DT. And then uh, basically it imports all of my acceleration ground history in a particular direction. Okay. And then um, I can actually go back and I can view the response spectrum because of this time history. And I, because this is actually uh, let me shift it. Uh, so delete kar dete. Let me delete that. So you can actually go there and you can see the response spectrum uh, of the time, all of the time histories that you have plotted, uh, that, that, you, that you have imported. Okay. So I need to play with this before I guys. Anyways, you know, you can see the response spectrum from here. Once you have done that, <clears throat> what you need to do is you create you need to create a load case. And in the load case, you know, you need to you need to specify that this is a time history load case. Okay. See? And this scaling would subsequently you will have to do it to match the uh, base here, but uh, you know at the bottom of the window you can see that uh, we have put in the number of time steps and uh, the time step increment again here. Okay, this is u one is the x direction, u two is the y direction. Uh, actually, u one is the local x direction and the local y direction of the nodes or the frame elements, basically nodes in this case. <clears throat> Once you have done it, all you need to do is you can run it um, like any other load case. You can go and you can set um, the load cases to run. And you can, you know, you can basically run it like that. And once you have done it, I'll click on run now and And because I believe was kind enough to do it already, I didn't have to wait for it to run. You can go back into uh, and see all the results. So this is the load case time history, the time history that we had imported uh, from uh, spectral matching. And I am displaying, um, for example, you know, the moment three, three uh, fill diagram and for frames I apply. And what it is actually showing is maximum, but I can actually specify the time period at which I, I want my values out. So for example, at one second, I want to see what is the magnitude of the moments in my frames due to earthquake loading. And it will show you all of those. You can increment it to 1.1 seconds, it will change. 1.2 seconds, it will change. Um, you can also see you know, the displacements and and basically you can uh, scroll through scroll through all the different displacements and see your building displacing in different directions so you see uh, i hope you guys can see the can you guys if you guys cannot see the model let me know uh, so this is how it is you know i am 0.6 seconds where you have this, then 0.7 seconds where you have that. As you can see, all of the forces are acting concurrently, you know, in both orthogonal directions. And this is what you can actually, uh, this is not possible with response spectrum analysis. So I know that I've skipped a lot of things here. Um, I've deliberately done that because I know that, you know, I can see some of you guys traveling and listening to the lecture, which is pretty much not possible. Uh, uh, but I, I just don't want, didn't want to lose your interest into it. 
in case um, some of you guys are interested, we can have a detailed session on this one. But um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what you can do with the Einstein analysis um, and how you can do it. So with that, I think uh, I'll close the floor and, uh, and hand it over to Tahir Saab uh, for further, um, you know, stop show, whatever. Is it Tahir Saab? You can stop show. Okay. Ji, sir. Tahir Saab, you're mute. Sorry, I was in an un uh, unmute position. Did you? So, so, have you completed it now? Sir, I just wanted to be brief because if I had a little more complicated, then everyone would have been sleeping. So... Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, the participants, the house is now open for your questions. Please go ahead if you have any questions. You can uh, type your questions. If you want to ask the questions via your microphones, you are most welcome. Kindly go ahead. Anybody who wants to ask a question can raise his hand. Right. The lecture was really informative. I hope it was not. Uh... I understand that many of the, the participants would not understand a lot of stuff that was going on, and I've skipped it um, deliberately because you know you need to really understand the concept of response spectrum and all that. Mm, and uh, I'll be really glad if someone wants to. Um, you know, learn this stuff. Uh, in my design office, uh, I have uh, made it a, a standard uh, all the projects will be um, designed through uh, time history analysis. And we actually are very thankful to Dr. Fawad Najam for providing us the updated, um, you know, the, 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 the updated S1 and SSs of all of the region which is in my case, in my opinion, it's really essential that we uh, use the, uh, we correct the ground motion hazard predictions that we have in UBC 97. So with those two tools, I think uh, we are trying to make a difference here, but uh, anyone who would be interested is welcome to, to learn and this stuff and we would be you know, able to make a more detailed presentations and lectures on this topic, if anyone is interested. We have two questions now. The, the first question is from Muhammad Ibra, uh, Muhammad Ibran. Uh, <clears throat> he's our regular participant and uh, he always participates very actively on our WhatsApp uh, group and here also. So his question is, what is short captivating column and why these columns are tend to attract seismic forces. <clears throat> uh, what sir again what is what are the short pedestal columns? No, what is short captivating column and why these columns are tend to attract seismic forces. Short captivating <clears throat> I don't know, understand what is meant by captivating, but I can tell you that anything that is short is very stiff. Um, so uh, the stiffness of a line element is 12 EI over L cube. L cube is in the denominator, right? So if you make anything short, um, it's actually increasing the stiffness of uh, that component by um, cube, right? So um, I can tell, I can actually say that once you increase the stiffness, you in, uh, it, in, it attracts a lot more force. So um, 
you know, the reason is uh, you make the thing smaller, you get a lot of force. <coughs> Uh, we have recently done a project in Mari where we encountered this situation, and uh, uh, this issue was resolved by putting by by actually freeing the top of the column. We put the whole roof on a neoprene pad, and uh, we basically uh, decreased uh, you know uh, the the stiffness of the whole element because it was too short and it was always always failing. So. I hope it answers the question. Next is next question is from uh, Miss Fatma Javed, and she has asked, uh, "Sir, please tell the methods to limit the displacement in the areas like Koita Valley, which is on high fault zone." Well, um, I don't. Uh... Clearly, I don't uh, completely understand as to what she means by limit displacement. I think she means limit interstory drift. Well, to increase, uh, to decrease interstory drift, you have to provide, uh, you have to increase the story stiffness. Uh, you do it by using shear walls and um, and and more columns. Or if that doesn't work, <clears throat> then you can basically resort to other systems such as um, you know. Steel in steel uh, structures and even in concrete structures, you can use cross bracing. In concrete structures, it's not really common to do cross bracing, and it's not very popular because of obvious reasons. But um, you know, uh, you have to increase the story shear to decrease the story little drifts. Okay, now we have a third question from. Uh, Muhammad Usman, probably. I can't read the full name. I think it is Muhammad Usman. So he had asked, huh? he had asked, what is impact? What does he mean by, sorry, sorry. I think he again retyped it. The question is, what is the impact of time history analysis on the cost of the project? Well, I, I think the right question should have been what is the effect of time history analysis on the safety of the project? Because if you do response spectrum analysis, which is an approximate analysis, and if you design a structure thinking that it is safe, uh, but and economical, and, and it turns out that the structure is not economic uh, safe uh, in the end, uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, on the other hand, um, con, um, we have done a number of projects uh, using time history analysis. I can tell you that the forces are more as compared to response spectrum analysis, but we tend to do much better in design because we can track the correlation between all of the uh, forces. Uh, so for example, in columns and in shear walls, uh, we do not unnecessarily include tension in the columns and the shear walls with minor axis bending and the major axis bending. If you're using ETAPS, what ETAPS does is it will take the tension in the shear wall, the axial tension in the shear wall, and it will combine it with the major axis bending and the minor axis bending, uh, the maximum values of both of them, and it will give you the longitudinal steel in it. That is very uneconomical. And, and you know, um, uh, you might find out uh, during time history analysis that uh, during the tension phase of the shear wall, um, the bend, major axis bending and the minor axis bending were not that much to start with. So we do, we have scenarios where uh, we, I would say it's typical to have more forces, but um, you know, their design would be more realistic and I would say more economical as compared to response spectrum analysis. I see. Now, we have another mic mute, please mute your mic. There's a lot of background noise to make it. Whose mic is, the microphone is open. Please mute your mic. Uh, uh, Fatsa, there is another question from Muhammad Imran, and he's asking why the weak beam strong column approach is used to design reinforced concrete frames subject to seismic loading. 
because we don't want the columns to fail. If you fail the column, you know, you will have a local uh, failure. But if you fail a beam, yes, you will have some local failure. You might, but um, if you know, uh, failing a column would affect all the stories above it. So columns need to be really there even during the shaking. Beam failure, yes, we need to avoid it and we design the beams um, to avoid it, but beam failure is relatively more, um, and I Rizwan Sahib is listening, so I don't want to use the wrong word here. Beam failure is relatively more acceptable as compared to um, you know, column failure. Rizwan Sahib, you want to add? Rizwan, would you like to add something? No, no, this is fine. He's right. We don't want the building to collapse. This is what he's saying. This is right. Okay, okay. Now we have another question from Muhammad Usman. And uh, he's asking, when we have to go for time history analysis, is it dependent upon the height of the building or the irregularities of the building? Well, it is, it is most useful when you have an irregular building. Um, I, um, it, you know, the response spectrum analysis is fine if you have a regular building that is four or five stories high. But as I've said, you know, what we have found in our you know, design office practice is even if you do that, uh, sometimes, you know, things are really creepy with the response spectrum analysis. For example, uh, if you have shear walls, uh, you know, you, you might want to look into the ETABS design manual as to what ETABS does when you have a shear wall and you're designing it uh, using ETABS. Um, and it's really disconcerting to see that what the ETABS does is it has, there are two possible values of the uh, you know, the two extreme values of the axial force in the shear walls uh, in an envelope. There are two possible values of major axis bending and there are two possible values of minor axis bending. What ETABS does is it designs your shear wall for each combination of the three uh, values. In reality, you know, you, you don't encounter majority of those combinations in actual in, in reality. So, you know, you sometimes this is, this is, you know, unconservative and you need to check. So I would say I would always, my design office, it doesn't take much time once you have developed the habit of using time history analysis. So we, we particularly, you know, I, we use uh, time history for all of the projects, but uh, if you use response spectrum analysis, for typical buildings that are four or five stories high, that's fine. Cool. Okay. Now we have another question from Muhammad Imran. And I'm not sure this question is uh, pertaining to today's topic, but uh, let me ask the question. Why the actual yield strength based on mill test should not exceed FY by more than 125 MPA in uh, <coughs> moment frame and special structural wall. So would you like to answer this question, Dr. Saab? Yes, uh, sir, I do. There are two reasons. Um, first of all, um, you know, my PhD research was, um, you know, discovering that shear failures start with bond failure you rarely encounter shear failures before uh, bond failure of longitudinal reinforcement. So, you know, if you increase the yield strength of the bars, uh, what happens is it puts more stress on the bond between the longitudinal reinforcement and the concrete. And that actually is, uh, has a detrimental effect on um, the state of concrete during uh, cycling. So uh, this was realized uh, by the researchers a while back and that's why you would not like to have um, yield uh, strength of the bars in, uh, beyond a certain upper limit. 
The second reason, of course, is if you have um, a special moment resisting frame, you limit the amount of, you have to design the member for MPY and MPR. MPR is basically, basically it's the, it's 1.25 times the yield you calculate the moment, the capacity of the section, and you make sure that your shear in the frame uh, element is, your shear in the frame element is able to take care of the, uh, the uh, shear in, in it due to uh, the, um, a double curvature bending. So, so uh, and, and the reason is that the shear failure is very brittle and code doesn't like it. Code would like your members to start failing in flexure, but code hates it if your members start to fail in shear because shear is not accompanied with much, um, you know, um, a warning. So <coughs> to limit that, if you, for example, if you have designed your, your shear reinforcement based on MPR values, which is 2 MPR over L, and your actual reinforcement is coming out to be, uh, the yield strength of the actual reinforcement coming out to be much more than 1.25L. That means that you have not designed your longitudinal members for the shear that would result from double uh, curvature bending. So that's why it's very important to have to understand uh, and have uh, the upper limit of this, uh, this yield strength on longitudinal reinforcement of frame elements and all elements that are subjected to significant cycling during um, during earthquakes. Doctor, uh, we have another question from uh, Mr. Tamur Hussain, and he's asking: Is time history analysis commonly used in Pakistan? No. People. People don't use it. People hate me for using it. People don't think it is necessary. So, no. And uh, now we have a question. Uh, looks like to me, uh, it's the last question. It's from Muhammad Zubair. And Mr. Zubair is asking, which hook is more important for steel in columns and beams? for earthquake zone, 90 degree or 135 degree? Well, um, I'll yield to Rizwan sir, but before I do, um, you know, the co the intent of all the hooks in the, if he's talking about the hooks in the stirrups, the intent of all the hooks is that once your, uh, you know, edge fibers, when once the edge of the column, uh, when the extreme fibers of the columns are <laughs> the crust, your, your stirrups don't open up. So 135 degree hook is much better because it, you know, it, it, uh, it, uh, it turns and it goes into the column uh, away from the extreme fibers as compared to 90 degree hook. And during cyclic loading, uh, even after significant damage or crushing of concrete at the perimeters of the, uh, or, or at the extreme fibers of the column, you do not get, um, you know, you, you, your uh, your uh, stirrups remain in place and your longitudinal bars don't buckle. Beyond that, I would, I think, Rizwan Saab said that we did in Jantani, so I yield to, to him. Rizwan, would you add something? This is correct, <clears throat> except that the <clears throat> stirrups and ties must be 135 degrees. They must be 135 degrees. Other uh, anchorage uh, can be done either by 180 degree hook or by 90 degree hook, they would be equivalent. Dr. Fawad is in any case right that if you could have a 135 degree hook, it would perform better. He's right. But it's not necessary uh, unless it is a strip, a stirrup, or a tie. Code doesn't require it. Okay, thank you, Rizwan. Now we have uh, another question from Muhammad Osama. And mm -hmm. Mr. Osama is asking, Sir, brief us, brief us a bit on the crack section of shear wall. I don't know. I think what he's asking, uh, 
uh, is why do we use crack sections of the shear wall? Well, the reason is because during earthquake shaking, you will get a significant damage. It is accumulated, especially uh, in the end zones of the shear wall. And there's a uh, degradation of stiffness uh, due to that damage. And, uh, you know, the easiest way code is, code is written for um, convenience, I would say. And the most convenient way to account for that lack of stiffness, by the way, is just to introduce a factor uh, um, to reduce the uh, shear stiffness of the walls. So um, basically, you know, reduction of stiffness of the walls is due to the damage um, or due to um, you know, earthquake excitations. Uh, in the, in the, in these uh, structural components, I, if I understand his question, you know, this is what he was asking. How can we check whether structure is section is cracked or not? Well, uh, in actual, you will pretty well know when the structure is uh, shear wall is cracked. You know, you'll see, and there will be a lot of cracking in the shear wall, and then. Uh, we, from the, you can see uh, when to use crack section modulus um, or not. Um, location matters. Yes, location of shear wall in building matters. Uh, you have to position all of the lateral force resisting systems uh, so that your center of rigidity and your center of uh, mass are you know as near as possible to each other. Most of the time, when we, if you work with architects, they hate shear walls and they put shear walls um, in, in uh, you know, uh, around the elevator shafts. And most of the time, these elevator shafts are located at one, uh, uh, you know, towards one end of the building. And that results, that does not you know, help your building. It makes your building more eccentric. And I don't know, but I saw this indigo height building and uh, it had a uh, very centric shear wall. So I hope that the designer had taken that into account. But provision of shear wall is not always beneficial. Uh, you need to carefully consider the position of the center of rigidity and your center of mass. Uh I think uh, you have answered all the questions. I don't know whether, yeah. Again, another question has come from Zubair Saab, Mr. Zubair. He's asking if we juggle or bend the steel bars of columns due to cover, is there any technique to get required bars strength? To get required bar strength. Um, what is meant by technique to get required bar strength? I don't completely understand the question. Maybe Rizwansa, can you help us here? I, don't know. <laughs> I think he has to rephrase it. But if you struggle the bar, he will lose cover. This is what he's saying. His cover will increase and D will decrease. This is what he's saying. Uh, uh, not only. If you can questions, then uh, everybody will feel easy to understand it, and uh, Dr. Saab or Mr. Rizwan can answer it uh, more conveniently. Okay. If we juggle or bend the steel bar or the column due to cover, is there any technique to? He is saying cover will decrease. So then you bend the <coughs> bars if the cover will decrease? No, cover will increase, which will mean yes. he will lose on D, which will mean he will lose on capacity. Is that correct, Dr. Fawad? I That is what I understand, sir. Well, the, the, the decrease in capacity would not be that much. Uh, have if you... the memory is large, the decrease yeah. in capacity wouldn't be much. But if you joggle uh, parallel to the member, uh, probably that should not be a problem. If you yeah, joggle at right angles to the edge, then yeah. you will lose on cover. That's uh, on key. Oh, he is referring that when there is not enough space for cover, then what you do? 
when you uh, reselect your bars it means your uh, member is congested this is what i would say you bundle the bars if you can't can, can you bundle the bars there when the space yes. is not enough yes you can bundle the bars and increase the uh, supply strength by 30% Use a larger bar. Increase the column size. What is the problem? Why so much congestion? It shouldn't be there. You uh, have to pour concrete into it. Azeb has Azeb Azeb has uh, has tried to clarify the question he's asking. He yes. Said, Azeb is is saying that he's asking about the load transfer. Will the load transfer will be affected if the bars are joggled uh, will the load transfer if the bars are joggled maybe this is the right uh, grammar if you can understand it uh, doc sir or rizwan you can answer it first i understand it question i think rizwan sir has answered it sir and all uh, rizwan sir is the king of structures was he the king of uh, retaining math ko mujhe puchta rahe the rizwan sir you are very good uh, he remembers the code by heart every comma full stop <laughs> okay uh, yeah, you know. uh, let me uh, answer this question <clears throat> load is load would have a pro transfer problem if the angle that you make through the joggling process is too sharp right. sharper than say 1 is to 4 1 is to 5 but if it is gentle you shouldn't have a problem so when you bend a bar and then restrain it the angle that you make should be gentle that's it when during the question answer session if uh, language should not be the barrier for anybody uh if anybody feels difficult in <laughs> he can uh, always come on the microphone and he can ask the question in urdu also no issues you should not be shy or uh, ask the question when you know sometimes when you write something uh, what is in your mind is it does not come up everything does not come up clearly when you are writing the text so you are free to ask question in urdu also no no issues So now, Tamur, Mr. Tamur Hussain, yeah, he has asked the question. What I have understood is the sir is that sir is asking that if we don't have enough cover and we bend the bars, can the strength of bars be calculated of those bent bars? Well, this question has been, I think, adequately answered. If there is no space, you can bundle it. You can uh, uh, increase the section, and uh, there are a lot of. Uh, options available but still if uh, rizwan or doctor want to answer uh, i leave it to them rizwan or doctor would you like to say anything this is an i think that's making give, my number. give him my number or doctor fawad's number uh, and we can discuss it at length right now after the lecture if he wants yeah because i don't understand his problem as to what exactly it is i have i don't understand it either now i have yet i am yet to encounter any uh, scenario in which this was a factor so that's why you know i probably if he wants to discuss he is welcome to do that inko na apna rizwan sahab ka aur doc sahab ka number de do ye khud hi kar lenge baat theek hai ye taimur sahab ko aur imran sahab ko ye dono ye question puch rahe hain moti ji baat mein summarize kar deta hu आप जॉगल सब करते हैं जब आपने सप्लाइस लगाना होता है जिस कवर पे ऊपर की बार आ रही होती है या नीचे की बार जा रही होती है वो आपस में टकरा जाएंगी अगर आप उनको जॉगल नहीं करेंगे अगर आप जॉगलिंग पैरेलल टू दी एज करेंगे तो आपका कवर लूज नहीं होगा ना गेन होगा आपका डी का लॉस नहीं होगा दैट इज इक्वेक्ट वे ऑफ डूइंग इट लेकिन कोर्ट दोनों तरह के सप्लाइस आपको अलाउ करता है अगर मेम्बर बड़ा है तो आपका डिफिशेंसी शॉर्टफॉल कम रहेगा मोमेंट में मेंबर छोटा है तो ये सिग्निफिकेंट हो जाएगा ये सिंपली बात है इसके अलावा आपको जॉगल कहीं भी नहीं करना पड़ता ये डॉक्टर साहब ने ठीक कहा है ओके जी थैंक यू वेरी मच नाउ वी आर ऑलमोस्ट एट द एंड ऑफ दिस आर्ट एक एक बात मैं करना चाह रहा हूं 
पार्टिसिपेंट बहुत से पार्टिसिपेंट मुझे लगता है कि झिझक रहे हैं सवाल पूछने से जो मैं बात किया है मैं उसको सेकंड करना चाहता हूँ कि इस फॉरम में वी आर लाइक ए फैमिली यहाँ पे कोई किसी का इम्तहान नहीं ले रहा ना कोई किसी के सवाल पे हंसेगा ना कोई किसी की जबान पे हंसेगा आपको जिस तरह से पूछना आता है वो पूछें इस फोरम का मकसद ही ये है कि हमारी जो यंगर जनरेशन है हमारे पास जो भी टूटा फूटा है जैसे हमने अपने बड़ों से लिया है हमारे बड़े बैठे हुए दरमियान में मेरे टीचर यहाँ पे मौजूद हैं हम उसको फेसफुली आगे ट्रांसफर कर सकें तो आप झिझके नहीं आपने ये सारा वजन इस मुल्क का आपने उठाना है I think we have lost Rizwan. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, be nice, be nice. ठीक है जी, as Rizwan has said, and I have also said many times that language should not be the barrier. एक चीज मैं भी उर्दू में आप लोगों को जरा बता दूँ. Today we don't have uh, much viewers from. Uh, uh, From Europe or America, those who listen, I don't know why, but uh, still we have the viewers there. But all of them can understand Urdu language. So, ये है कि यार आप में और जो हाँ हम experienced लोग बैठे हैं, मेरे professor यहाँ बैठे हैं, यहाँ के audience साहब, I'm really privileged that he is here today. Dr. Fawad Muzaffar or uh, Rizwan Mirza, very senior engineers, and we have uh, Sahil uh, Raza also. तो आप में और इन लोगों में फर्क सिर्फ नॉलेज का है बाकी आप कुछ आप भी हमें सिखा सकते हैं कुछ हम भी आप लोगों को सिखा सकते हैं ये इस जज्बे के साथ आप लोग अटेंड किया करें और क्वेश्चन जरूर पूछें अब चूंकि ये एक माशाल्लाह हमारी जो ट्रांसमिशन है इट गोज अप टू थ्री कॉन्टिनेंट्स में लोग देखते हैं इस वास्ते हम लेक्चर को इंग्लिश में रखते हैं सो दैट एवरीबडी कैन अंडरस्टैंड इट क्वेश्चन आप पूछ लिया करें जहां पे जरूरत हो मैं उसको ट्रांसलेट कर लिया करूंगा अगर कोई जरूरी चीज है वैसे तो टेक्निकल लैंग्वेज में जब आप बात करते थे तो अंडरस्टैंड इट नो इश्यूज तो नाउ अगर अभी भी है हमारे पास पांच छह मिनट अगर आप पूछना चाहते हैं क्वेश्चन क्वेश्चन सर वाई मेनी डिजाइनर यूजली डिजाइन प्रोजेक्ट विद ई एल एफ मैथड वी है They put, they have put objection. Why you use R S in it? Talk, sir. I don't think anybody should use objection as to why someone has uh, resorted to response vector analysis because equivalent load, E L F method or equivalent load force method is just an approximation. Um, it is used uh, by. It, it can be near the actual um, behavior if you have a. You know, building that is really symmetric and it's really um, sort of you know it has a few stories, but nobody should object to using RSA or time history analysis because RSA is more accurate as compared to time history analysis, and uh, time history analysis is more accurate as compared to response vector analysis. Mohammad Zubair, please go through your uh, come to the mic, unmute your mic Thank and ask. थैंक यू सर सर मेरा क्वेश्चन ये था कि जब हम अब हमारा जो कालम है ना वो समझो फुट बाई फोर्टी या बारह इंच बाई बारह इंच का है जब हम छत की कंक्रीट करते हैं ना वो बारह फुट बारह इंच एक तेरह इंच का हो जाता है तो बारह इंच का करने के लिए हमें कालम को जैगल करना पड़ता है तो उसकी स्ट्रेंथ लूज होगी डेफिनेटली जब हम बार को बेंड करेंगे तो स्ट्रेंथ लूज होगी उस तो स्ट्रेंथ को कवर करने के लिए सर कोई टेक्निक हो Um, Papa, you are right that you lose a uh, you know a fraction of the strength by joggling the bars, but this is what uh, you know. So you are assuming I, I'll I'll sensitize you to the accuracy of the mathematics that we are doing in design office. You are assuming your uh, your concrete strength to be equal to two thousand or three thousand or four thousand psi, right? Have you ever? Have you have you ever considered it? What is the actual strength of concrete on in uh, in field? It is much more than that in most of the cases because it is probably for two thousand psi. 
you, you have to try really hard to have a mix that gives you 2000 PSI, it will somewhere around 2600-2700 PSI, right? So, um, uh, so similarly for 3000 PSI, the target strength is much more than it's around 4000 PSI as per ACI. So you end up with, uh, with, with uh, material properties that are way more away uh, from, from the values that you are assuming. So the amount of loss of strength due to jogging of bars is not a concern. It is absolutely, you know, you just be comfortable with it. There's no issue with it. Thank you. So if there are any more questions, we still have a few minutes if you want to ask, you are most welcome. Dr. Uh, we have a question in a chat box. If the column has high strength concrete, 1.4 times, then beam, does it affect the performance of building during earthquake load or gravity load and transfer of loads between beam and column? The only things are that in this case, the only thing that we should think about is, um, you know, the region of concrete around um, uh, two feet uh, from the perimeter of the column at the interface of the column and, and the beam or at the interface of the column and the slab. Um, you know, we should not have a weak layer of slab between uh, columns that are at two stories. Um, otherwise, there, should, there, is no, there is no issue with having two members uh, at, uh, with different strengths. We use it all the time. Okay, now Osama is asking, Muhammad Osama is asking, sir, when the system will become the dual system? Well, uh, the system becomes a dual system uh, if you have sig significant amount of shear walls. And, and I know what the question is, what is significant amount of shear walls? Well, I think I would say that if your uh, total floor shear, uh, I remember that there is a limit to it. I don't remember the value exactly, but uh, you know, from good engineering practice, I would say that if your total shear, 25% um, of total floor shear is being carried by the shear walls, at least, or 30% of the total uh, floor shear is carried by the shear walls, at least, um, then I'll, I'll categorize it as a dual system. You know, if you have a shear wall which carries only 5% of the, the floor shear, um, you cannot say that you you have a dual system and and uh, whereas it's just uh, most of it is you know just resisted by the columns ji mohammed imran is asking again i think this issue was already answered but still i think he wants does seismic hook also include 90 degree hook uh, let me let me get back to him on this one because I think uh, 90 degree hook is not seismic. It's at least it's 35 degree hook is, is a seismic hook. I think you are you are you are quite on this issue. It's you, he has to use 135. Anyhow, yeah. he, uh, Rizwan is not here now. Otherwise, we could have taken his comment again. So uh, I'll confirm it in a while. I'll just uh, need to look at it. Have you, uh, my colleague has just gone out of the mm -hmm. office and I'll be able to do it. But we, we can take uh, other questions in the meanwhile. No worries. We'll come back to this one. Gee. Gee, if there is any other question, please uh, ask through microphone or by writing text. Most welcome. I would like to take this opportunity to actually acknowledge uh, Tahir Sultan Sahib, um, you know, Rizwan Sahib and others who have joined uh, with this initiative. Uh, you know, uh, other than this initiative, there is no, no way uh, to, 
to interact with a number of, you know, a lot of these people who would like to have a exchange of views and, and experiences through this, uh, through some forum, if not through this forum. So, you know, this is really, really, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Doc Sir. Thank you for your appreciation. We are trying our best to serve the engineers through Pakistan's Society of Civil Engineers. This is the only motive we have to spread the knowledge, to impart the knowledge, and uh, to bring learned people on this. Um, my colleague is, uh, has confirmed that uh, for a hook to be seismic, it has to be on 35 degree hook. Okay, so now, okay, now we, as such, we have no questions. So, okay, Dr. Saab, let me thank you from the core of my heart, a very knowledgeable lecture and the questions, the interaction with the participants were excellent. And for me, this lecture was uh, nostalgic. Uh, this was my favorite subject when I was doing masters back in 1984 to 86. And uh, I was, it was my privilege that I studied this uh, subject structural dynamics from Professor Haluk Akhtan, who was considered at that time, one of the top professors for this uh, earthquake structures. And uh, I am still in contact with him and uh, hopefully one day he will agree to come on this platform. He's retired now, but still I am, uh, forcing him to come on this platform and give lecture on uh, whatever he thinks he can. So uh, let's hope he will come one day here and give the lecture. So, Dr. Saab, what's up? Thank you very much for uh, coming again, third time on this uh, uh, platform. And uh, we will again ask you sometime to come back and give the lecture. And uh, again, as I said, it was my privilege that uh, Mia Ziauddin, our professor in UET, also was here today. And uh, um, uh, there was uh, Mr. Professor uh, Fuad Najam. He also gave the lecture last time, I think a uh, few lectures back, a few months back. He, he gave a lecture, a very nice lecture also on, on this, uh, let's say, earthquake. That was really a good lecture also. So he's also here. Thank you very much, Madam Saab, for taking interest. Uh, now some announcements. Dr. Saab, your shield and your certificate will be will reach your office through courier, inshallah. Ms. Sadia will send it to you. And uh, the participants who are here, they will receive the lecture. Uh, they will receive the certificates uh, uh, on, let's say, three days from now. They can uh, collect the certificates from uh, our office in Gulberg, Lahore, which is 32 Gulberg, Maine, and 32 B2 Gulberg, Maine, Lahore. Collected after three days, inshallah. And uh, <clears throat> announcement about next lecture, lecture number 28 will take place on 13th March, 2021. The guest speaker would be Dr. Ali Sajid. And this lecture is would be slightly, you would uh, drift from the technical lectures. It will be on team building and essential yet missing elements in technical organizations. Very important topic for the engineers. Important and I think uh, people must uh, attend this lecture also. This, I have also felt that management skills uh, and team building skills are always missing in the engineers. So with the technical knowledge, with your technical expertise, this expertise, management uh, expertise should also be developed among the young engineers. And for your information, magazine number nine has been issued and it is already uh, on our uh, uh, website. It's the ninth issue of our civil engineering ma magazine. It is now posted on our website and uh, news ninth newsletter will also be po posted shortly. I think today or tomorrow it will be on the website. So please uh, visit the website and read it. 
And I would also request the participants who are here today and those who are not the members of uh, associates of PSE, kindly join PSE. We are, you know what job we are doing. So please uh, help us, join us. And uh, you can also join uh, uh, anybody who is interested in writing any article or any, in, uh, in any shape, he can contact uh, Rizwan Mirza. He's the editor in chief of our uh, publication board. So please uh, contact him and uh, you can uh, always contact uh, anybody, any of us uh, on the management of PSC through Mrs. Sadia Naveed and uh, most welcome everybody. So today we have about 185 associates and uh, people are now joining. We, we are uh, day by day, we are incre increasing our fraternity. Inshallah, soon uh, we will have uh, many more joining PSC. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, the last announcement, which uh, is uh, which I have been asked by the government authorities that uh, COVID is still there. So please uh, take all preventive measures. And uh, uh, it is, you know, what are these measures? You have to wash your hands and use the mask whenever you are in uh, the public. So please follow what the government of Pakistan is requesting everybody to do so, so that we can get rid of this pandemic. And in the end, uh, I would also like to thank, Rizwan is not here, Rizwan, Mrs. Sadia Naveed, and my, my technicians who are working in the background to give you, to make this uh, transmission flawless good or with good audio and good video and we uh, our people uh, at other stations keep on monitoring uh, our transmission the audio level and the video level and during the uh, lecture they keep us giving us the feedback or the quality of transmission and i have been told that today's transmission was also good so thank you very much all those who made effort to make this transmission successful thank you very much stay safe May Allah bless you all. Thank you, Ji. Allah. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank Allah. you. Thank you. Allah bless. Thank you, sir.